Uh, as Asia countries like China and Vietnam now moving towards embracing capitalism, market liberalization, I wanted to know what other aspect that U.S. I mean, what other U.S. aspect measures can can Washington stamp your further influence in Asia? Would there be a, something like a NATO type of arrangement in Asia one day to deal with the different challenges now, such as terrorism and or you know, with countries like North, uh, North Korea and 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 the problem in the Middle East? Would they, would this be something to be explored in the future? Thank you. Let me begin, and maybe others can, uh, can comment on that as well. I think one of the characteristics of Asia is that there is not a common security perception throughout the region. Uh, in Northeast Asia, the security concerns are not the same as the concerns in Southeast Asia. I think that trying to create a NATO type of an approach to security in this region uh, would immediately run into the difficulty of the differing security concerns. You already see this in the NATO area, where the views of the new Eastern European members of NATO are quite different in terms of their perception of the security challenges from those in the western parts of NATO who are not as immediately concerned with those questions. That doesn't mean that there are not ways to strengthen security mechanisms in East Asia. I think that's going to take time, but for example, the ASEAN Regional Forum has considerable potential for playing a more constructive role in trying to deal uh, with problems. Just as the consultative mechanisms within ASEAN have shown themselves remarkably uh, effective in keeping all of the numerous bilateral differences that exist among ASEAN members from turning into a type of balkanized confrontation and, and uh, conflict, which has made that region live up to its name. So I, I do think there are ways to approach common security interests, but one needs to be careful about trying to develop new organizational structures uh, along those lines unless they naturally evolve. I think after seeing NATO in Afghanistan, I don't think anybody is scared of it or that that's going to be the benchmark. I mean, that for so long, NATO represented the world's most powerful military alliance. But the first time it has kind of been asked to perform in a region, uh, it's, it's pretty hardly impressive. I mean, so, so, but the metaphor uh, is important in a sense. Uh, the metaphor will be used in, in much of the discourse when India conducted joint exercises with the U.S., Japan, Australia, and Singapore in September 2007, I mean, the Chinese media were clearly saying, look, this is Asian NATO in the making. We're going to oppose this. We don't like it. So, and, and so while at the, at the propaganda level, at the level of discourse, this idea would be there, it's quite clear nobody's ready for it. And I don't think it's possible to construct one. For example, when the government changed in Australia, the first thing the Australian new government, Kevin Rudd government did, was to walk out of the Japanese initiative uh, of Asian democracies getting together. Uh, so whichever you structure it, I, I don't think anybody is ready to take on the Chinese or construct it, a form, uh, you know, an alliance against any other country. So for, quite, for the foreseeable future, I think it is, uh, how do you construct various arrangements without any one of them being seen as a, a rigid uh, uh, alliance that defines a clear enemy at the stage? If you want to start the discussion, we're talking about collaboration. We're not talking about unilateral thinking. We're talking about a lot of change. And you've got a lot of power figures out there right now. Yes, Hillary made the policy statement. She's here visiting. Who would you like to see at the table having these discussions right now? The United States has um, treaty relationships with Japan, with South Korea, with um, Philippines, with Thailand, and with Australia. So there are these bilateral consultations between treaty allies. The United States also has um, bilateral consultations with ASEAN, in what we in the ASEAN family call ASEAN plus one. Um, the United States also has a seat at the ASEAN Regional Forum which is, um, as I say, the only political security forum of the region. And I very much agree with State that the United States should help us 
make this forum evolve and make it move from confidence building, which is stage one, into preventive diplomacy and finally into a forum capable of actually problem solving. In addition, the United States has a seat at the APEC table. And APEC table is very important for, not, for two reasons. One, it brings together 21 major economies in the Pacific um, region, which as I said earlier, together account for 60% of world GDP. But it is also very important strategically because it brings together the two sides of the Pacific Ocean. And I think this is the unspoken subtext of the importance of APEC. For those of us old enough to remember the Pacific War, we do not want to see another war between the two sides of the Pacific. And, and APEC, in my view, is not only important economically, but it is also important strategically because it links the United States to East Asia. So I think there are already many tables. I'm not sure you need, uh, you need to invent another one. Our Australian friends wants to create a new table, the Asia Pacific Council. Um, my, my ASEAN colleagues and I are a bit skeptical. We feel that we have quite enough table, and let's try to you know, make them work rather than create another one. Let, let me just add, because I, get, I basically agree with what uh, Tommy said. If you want to deal with the North Korean nuclear issue, the six-party talks is exactly right. It brings in the six countries that are most directly affected by that particular issue. All of them have interests in the success or failure of the question, and trying to do it with four or five, or et cetera, is far less effective. So there they got it right. I think the ASEAN plus three has worked effectively as an Asian institution for coordinating, and it emerged out of dissatisfaction with the U.S. response to the Asian financial crisis in 1997. That's when you began to have summits there, and that was a good thing. But those summits probably wouldn't have occurred if President Clinton hadn't started the practice of having APEC summits back in 1993. Uh, and therefore, people became comfortable with dealing at the summit level, and prior to that, you hadn't had that type of summit meeting. But I was just at a trilateral conference in Shanghai among the United States, China, and Russia. Remember the strategic triangle? Well, one thing that was quite clear is that strategic triangle is not the right way to deal with the problems of Asia. But we also have a U.S.-China-Japan potential dialogue. China, South Korea, and, and uh, Japan already have a trilateral dialogue. One of the problems with the U.S.-China-Japan dialogue is would be talking about the Korean Peninsula. How can you talk about the Korean Peninsula without your Koreans there? So there's a problem. Some people think a G2 is the approach. The United States and China rule the world. Well, yes, would rule the world, but everybody else in the world would be against that particular type of arrangement. So maybe that's not so good. I think the G20 is a much better approach to dealing with the global financial crisis than the G7. Who are the G7? They brought the crisis on us. You know, uh, why should we think they can lead us out of it? We have to bring in all these other uh, economies. So it's a much better approach. You essentially have to table uh, to tailor who's at the table to what the issue is. And then you either get it right or not. When Germany began to approach reunification, they were completely botching the question because you couldn't deal with the problem without dealing with German-Polish borders. Poland needed guarantees. So finally they came up with a 4 plus 2 approach. It turned out to be exactly the right approach to take to the German unification issue. If they hadn't come up with that, the issue would have been much more difficult to deal with. So getting it right is very important, but the group depends on the issue.